Hello, this lecture is going to be covering Chapter 5, Medical Terminology. It's important to, to know um, that EMTs need a working knowledge of medical terminology. And the importance of this is because um, as we speak with other medical professionals, we need to have a common language. Um, we need to be able to understand each other, and it's more professional if we're speaking in our, our uh, proper medical terminology. Um, as EMTs, we need to understand key terms, acronyms, symbols, and um, approved abbreviations. And we'll talk about that throughout this uh, slideshow. It can be important to know medical terminology and, and know the process of medical terminology because it can help you determine the meaning of an unknown word. There are going to be times throughout your career, or there's still times in my career, where I see a medical term that I've never seen before. I can work through it and understand what that term means by knowing how medical terminology is formed and how med medical terms are formed. Um, learning the definitions for parts of a term is important in that aspect as well. Understanding um, medical jargon leads to effective communication. So as I said before, this is going to help us to communicate with um, our coworkers and communicate with other medical professionals, um, again, in, a, in an effective and professional uh, means of communication. So let's break down um, medical terms. Let's talk about the anatomy of a medical term. Medical terms are made up of distinct parts that perform specific functions. Um, changing or deleting any part of that uh, medical term um, can, can change the, the function or the meaning of that word. So for example, here we have hypertension versus hypotension. So there's two prefixes on these words, hyper and hypo, and those both mean uh, vastly different things. Um, tension in this in this case referring to uh, the the patient's blood pressure, so hypertension means high blood pressure, or elevated blood blood pressure, versus hypotension which means decreased or low blood pressure. So just simply changing, um, you know that that prefix from hyper to hypo um, completely changes the meaning of the word. And when we completely change the meaning of a word, especially when it relates to something like the blood pressure, this can um, this could create a, a huge problem for this patient if you report to the hospital incorrectly that the patient has high blood pressure when in reality they've got very low blood pressure. That's going to change the treatment modalities moving forward and that's going to cause you know, some, some undue hardship on that patient just because you incorrectly reported that medical term. Components that comprise medical terms include the root, uh, excuse me, the, the word root, um, which is the main meaning of, of the term. Uh, the prefix, like I just described there, hyper, hypo, there's many other prefixes that we'll talk about. Um, suffix, so what comes after the word, and then combining vowels, so things, uh, vowels that will um, combine these, uh, all these parts of a medical term together. How the parts of a term um, are combined determine that uh, term's meaning. Accurate spelling is essential, so for example, um, phasia, P-H-A-S-I-A -A means speaking versus phasia, which is pronounced very similarly. P-H-A-G-I-A -A means eating or swallowing. So if we put a prefix in front of that, D-Y-S, dis, which means difficult or painful, dysphagia or dysphagia means vastly different things. However, the word sounds the same and is nearly spelled the same. So one means difficulty speaking, dysphagia with an S. Uh, dysphagia with a G means difficulty eating or swallowing. So again, just changing one simple letter in an entire word changes the complete meaning of that word. So uh, be very particular and very careful when you're, when you're documenting and uh, selecting these terms. How the parts of a term are combined determines its meaning. Um, it's important to know knowledge of anatomy. It's important to know the context of how the words are used. So, for example, another uh, another couple of terms that mean uh, or that sound very similar uh, and are spelled very similar, uh, but mean different, vastly different things. Ilium and ilium, they would both sound exactly the same. One is spelled with an I and one is spelled with an E. Um, ilium with an I refers to the upper portion of a hip bone. Ilium with an E refers to a part of the small intestine. So. By understanding the context of, of how that term is used, um, you can understand um, what 
term that person or that other medical professional is referring to. So you have to not only know the terms, but you have to be able to put those terms into a specific context. Are we talking about bones here or are we talking about the patient's gastrointestinal tract? And that's going to determine which, um, which term we're using in that case. Word roots is a uh, word root is the main part or the stem of a word, and that conveys the essential meaning, uh, and that is um, frequently indicating a particular body part. Is, is typically, the the root word is a body part. Uh, word roots uh, add or change a prefix, um, or a su or excuse me, you can add or change a prefix or a suffix to a word root to change the meaning of that term. Cardiopulmonary, for example, breaks down into two terms: cardio and pulmon or pulmonary, which cardio re refers to, which is a root word referring to the heart. Pulmon or pulmonary is a word root referring to the lungs. So if we are resuscitating somebody and we are performing cardiopulmonary resuscitation, which is what the term CPR stands for, um, we are uh, performing treatment on their heart and their lungs. So cardiopulmonary resuscitation means we are resuscitating their heart and their lungs. We're introducing air into the lungs and we're circulating blood by compressing the heart. So that is how we can combine root words and, and, and combine these medical terms together um, to achieve the, the proper meaning. Prefixes appear at the beginning of a word. They usually describe location or intensity. Um, also found in general language. So think of things like um, autopilot or submarine or tricycle auto, sub, and tri of those words is the prefix. Um, however, not all medical terms have prefixes. The prefix gives the root word a specific meaning. So for the root word P-N-E-A, or Nia, uh, one can add the prefix A, Brady, or Tacky, and that is going to give us three different terms. The root word P-N-E-A refers to uh, breathing. So if we say, if we put an A as the prefix, or apnea, that it gives us uh, the term for without breathing, or no breathing. The patient is not breathing. That is apnea, or apneic. The term braid, bradypnea is slow breathing, versus tachypnea, which is fast breathing. So you can see there how we add a prefix to a root word, and that creates three different or multiple different terms. By learning commonly used prefixes, you can figure out the meaning of unfamiliar terms. Suffixes. Suffixes appear at the end of a word. It usually indicates a procedure, a condition, a disease, or a part of speech. Uh, commonly used suffix, one of the most commonly used suffixes is itis, I-T-I-S, and that uh, essentially means inflammation, inflammation or infection. <clears throat> Pair that with a, a root word of arthro, which is... Uh, is the root word for joint, and that's going to create arthritis or an inflammation of the joints. Uh, so that is combining a, a suffix to a root word. I, I forgot to mention it earlier, but um, I'm gonna I'm gonna at, through this uh, presentation I'm gonna talk about a handful of root words here and there. But by no means am I going to cover every uh, word root. I'm not even going to scratch the surface on all the word roots that it's important for you to know. The important thing to think about here is as you're reading your textbook, you start to pick up on these root words. You start to pick up on them in the vocabulary sections. You start to pick up on them um, in the case studies and in uh, just in general reading of the chapter. You're going to learn a lot of, of root words and a lot of prefixes and suffixes. We're not, we don't have the time to, to cover every one of these um, in one lecture. It would, it would take us all, you know, essentially all of class because to be quite honest, I'm still learning um, root words and prefixes and suffixes as I go throughout my career in EMS. Um, there's, there's thousands and thousands of different medical terms, um, and as you go on in this class and as you continue on in your career, you're going to continually uh, learn these. The point of this, this class today is, is for you to understand the process of putting those root words with prefixes and suffixes and being able to break those down so that you can um, understand a term that maybe you're not familiar with. All right, combining vowels. So combining vowels uh, connect a root word um, to a suffix or another root word. Um, for, in most cases, it's an O, but in some cases, it can be an I or an E. 
So that's used when, uh, when joining, a suffix that begins with a consonant or another root word. So an example here is gastroenterology. Gastroenterology refers to the stomach, the intestines, and ology is the study of. So the study of the stomach and the intestines. That's what gastroenterology is. We already talked about a, a root word just a, a few slides ago that um, was joined with an O. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation. So CPR cardiopulmonary is the heart and the lungs with that O in between that are joining those two root words together. Combining form, a combining vowel uh, sh uh, shown with the root word. Um, again, some more combining forms um, that you may see, uh, like I just mentioned before, cardio, um, gastro referring to the stomach, uh, hepato referring to uh, liver, hepatic refers to the liver, um, arthro refers to the joint, osteo refers to uh, bones, and pulmon or pulmono refers to the lungs. So just to, to cover some of those word building rules again, um, the prefix is at the beginning of a term, the suffix is at the end of a term, and we're going to use a combining vowel when we're putting suffixes together with, uh, with uh, root words and, and between a consonant. Um, a term uh, can occasionally have more than one root word uh, or word root, and that is when we're going to use that combining vowel. All right, uh, some rules for plural endings. So if we have to change a term from singular to plural, sometimes you're going to add an S. For example, lung changes to lungs. However, if you have a word that ends in an A, typically that changes. And, and again, these are all, are all um, general rules. There are exceptions to these rules. But generally, if it ends in an A, it's going to change to AE. So vertebra changes to vertebrae. IS generally changes to ES. So diagnosis changes to diagnoses. EX or IX changes to ICES or ISIS. So apex would change to apices or apices. O-N or U-M uh, changes to an A typically. So ganglion changes to ganglia or ovum changes to ova. U-S changes generally to an I. So bronchus will change to bronchi. And again, it's important to know these because um, it's going to make you um, uh, present yourself as being more professional and knowledgeable when you use the proper plural terms, pl proper plural endings um, for these medical terms. Pref uh, so we're talking about some special word parts. Prefixes can, in can indicate numbers, colors, positions, and directions as well. Um, prefixes that are indicating numbers, for example, here, uh, uni, uh, di, or diply. Um, null, prime, uh, primy, or, or preemy, uh, uh, multi, or bi. So two, uh, any, any term that involves two or more parts or sides, you're going to have a prefix relating to uh, that particular number. Um, several word roots describe color. So for example, uh, cyan. Cyan is a bluish color. If a patient is uh, presenting with uh, cyanotic skin or cyanosis, that is bluish skin. So understanding that there are some colors that also can um, uh, present as a prefix to, to a word root. Positions and directions. Prefixes can describe a position, direction, or a location. Um, a, B, A, D, D, circum is a common one. So there's a vessel in your heart called the circumflex. And that circumflex goes uh, around the circumference of the heart. So that's just a term for describing position uh, direction or location. Common direction, movement, and position terms. So directional terms, um, directional terms are needed um, to discuss where an injury is located and how the pain radiates through the body. Some different directional terms that we're going to talk about: right and left, superior and inferior, lateral and medial, proximal and distal, and superficial and deep. And we'll break each of these. So ventral and dorsal, palmar and plantar, and apex. So again, these are all directional or movement or position terms. So let's start off with superior and inferior. Superior is a term that means nearer to the head. And the opposite would be of that would be inferior, 
which means nearer to the feet. Um, these terms describe the relationship of one structure to another. So for example, you would say that the knee is superior to the foot and the knee is inferior to the pelvis. So it's closer to the head from the foot and it's closer to the feet uh, from the pelvis. Does that make sense? Hopefully um, superior towards the head, inferior towards the feet. Lateral and medial. Uh, lateral means outer, so outer part of the body, body parts that lie further from the midline. So if you took, a, um, if you took an imaginary line and drew it directly down the center of the body, lateral means away from that midline. Medial means inner or towards that midline, body parts that are closer to that midline. So for example, a five centimeter laceration on the medial aspect of the thigh means toward the inside of the thigh. Proximal and distal, these terms describe the relationship of any two structures on an extremity. So we're just talking about the extremity here. Proximal is uh, a term that refers to something being closer to the trunk of the body. So closer to, essentially closer to the chest or the trunk of the body. Distal is a term that means further from the trunk of the body. So what I like to think of with distal is distal is distant. It's distant, it's away from the body. So for example, the elbow is distal to the shoulder, but the elbow would be proximal to the wrist and the hand. So again, these are directional terms and they're relationship terms. So they're describing two different structures. So I would say that my hand is distal to my uh, elbow, or my hand is distal to my shoulder. It's further away from the trunk of my body. Um, versus proximal, which means closer to the trunk. Superficial and deep. Um, superficial means closer to the or on the skin. Um, deep means further inside the body tissues or further away from the skin, you know, towards the towards the body or towards the bone. So uh, typically we talk about superficial and deep when we're describing burns or lacerations. So a superficial burn would be like sunburn. That's close to or on top of the skin. A deep burn would be, you know, a, a, a third degree burn where, where it's actually into the tissues of the skin. A deep laceration would be a cut that's deeper into the tissues as like a cut with a knife versus a superficial laceration, would, which would be like a, a small scratch or a, or a paper cut. Ventral and dorsal. Uh, ventral refers to the belly side of the body or the anterior side of the body. So two terms that essentially mean the same thing as ventral and anterior. Those refer to the belly side of the body. Dorsal or posterior, so two terms that essentially mean the same thing again. Do dorsal or posterior refers to the spinal side or the back side of the body. And the way I like to think about dorsal or posterior is the dorsal fin of a dolphin is on their back. So dorsal is on the back, Ventral or anterior is the front side of the body. And again, those, those two terms are more commonly used. Typically, we don't use ventral or dorsal. Um, more commonly, you're going to see it um, used as anterior or posterior. And again, that's the front and the back of the body. Palmar and plantar. Uh, palmar surface is the front of the hand or the palm. And plantar is the bottom of the foot. Plantar is the bottom or, or, or the, the underside of your foot, and palmar is the palm. Apex or apices is the tip of a structure. So the apex of the heart is the bottom of the ventricles. So it's the tip. It's not necessarily the top of a structure. It's the tip of the structure. So the apex of the heart is actually the bottom of the ventricles because the heart actually forms out into kind of an apex or a tip at the ventricles. So apex means the tip of a structure. Some different movement terms that you may, uh, that you may use. Um, flexion is the bending of a joint. So for this one, I like to think of, of flexing your muscles. So if you were to flex your bicep, you're bending your elbow. So that's flexion, it's bending of a joint. Extension is if you were to hold your arm straight out, it's straightening of a joint. So extension is straightening and flexion is bending. Adduction with a D is motion toward the midline. 
and abduction with a B is motion away from the midline. And I like to think of abduction by thinking of uh, if you were to abduct someone, you, were take it, you would be taking them away. So I think abduction, uh, take away. So that's motion away from the midline. Adduction is motion toward the midline. Uh, some other directional terms, bilateral. Um, bilateral would mean both sides of the midline. So your eyes are bilateral, your ears are bilateral, hands, feet, your lungs. Um, if you're listening to lung sounds, for example, and both sides are clear, you would present that as clear bilateral lung sounds, meaning it's both sides of the midline. Unilateral is one side of the body. So if I were to have uh, breath sounds only on one side of the body, I would have unilateral breath sounds to the right or to the left side. If I were to be having a, um, stroke symptoms and I would have weakness or paralysis to one side, that would be unilateral weakness or unilateral paralysis. It's only one side of the body. Other directional terms um, that you may encounter, the abdominal cavities divided into four equal quadrants. We would describe those as the right upper, left upper, right lower, and left lower quadrant. So if you're describing any sort of abdominal pain or abdominal injuries, you're going to describe it using one of those four quadrants. Uh, to, uh, you know, it's important to learn these concepts so that you can describe the location of any injury or your assessment findings. Medical personnel then will be able to know where to look and what to expect upon your arrival into the hospital. So it's important for you, again, to use these proper medical terms, the movement, position, and direction terms, so that when you get into the hospital, the trauma team, the trauma doctor, the emergency room physician, they know where to look based on the report that you've given. All right, anatomic positions. Anatomic positions are positions that the body can be in, so different positions that your, uh, your patient's is in. Uh, prone and supine, these both, both positions are lying flat. Just depends on whether you're lying on your belly or lying on your back. Prone means lying face down, so lying on your belly. Supine means lying face up or lying flat on your back. So that's prone and supine. Fowler position is semi-reclining with the head elevated. Um, so if we're in a Fowler position, we are essentially lying on our backs with our head just elevated slightly. The semi-Fowler position is when the patient's head is elevated at a 45 degree angle. So this is um, one of the more common positions that we transport patients to the hospital, and it's a comfortable position. They're lying flat on their back, except their, their head and torso is elevated up to 45 degrees. The high Fowler position is uh, when you're sitting at a 90 degree angle. So sitting straight up, that would be described as the high Fowler position. Um, use the meaning of, uh, of parts to decipher the term. So again, as I, as I talked about before, um, use break these words apart so that you can understand the term. If you encounter a term that you, you don't know, you've never seen before, as you're reading your chapters in your book, you see a word that you're not familiar with, try to break it down. Um, define the suffix, the prefix, and the word root. So some examples of breaking these, <clears throat> these words apart. Um, nephropathy uh, in uh, uh, nephr, uh, referring to the kidneys. Um, pathy, referring to disease. And then that O is the combining form. Um, so this uh, essentially means disease of the kidney. Dysuria, uh, we break this down, dis and then urea. Um, dis meaning difficult, painful, or abnormal. And then uh, urea meaning a condition of the urine. So dysuria is painful urination or difficult urination. Hyperemesis, hyper is a prefix meaning uh, excessive. Emesis is the word root meaning vomit or vomiting. So hyperemesis would be excessive uh, vomiting. Um, shorthand used for communication. Um, shorthand can help with speed. However, you don't want to trade speed for accuracy. Um, use only common understood acronyms and abbreviation to minimize errors. Um, I have uploaded uh, an approved medical abbreviation um, document to the Google Classroom and to Jones and Bartlett Navigate. 
um, so that you can um, take a look at some approved medical um, abbreviations. As you go throughout this course and throughout your career, you're going to pick up on some of those abbreviations and you'll start to be able to, to, to write in uh, medical shorthand. This is not something that you're going to master early on. It's not something that you're really going to be, uh, to, to be quite honest, you're not going to be very comfortable with it um, as an EMT coming out of EMT school. As you progress throughout your career, certainly if you, uh, you know, move on towards paramedics or you remain as an EMT for, for many years, you're going to slowly start to pick up a lot of abbreviations and shorthand, and it's going to help you to write your report um, quicker. However, we don't write reports as much as we used to because of uh, the advent of technology and, and mobile, mobile data computers and, and tough books for writing reports. We do a lot of typing now. So we still do use some abbreviations in our typing, um, but some of the shorthand symbols we don't use nearly as much because we're not writing down reports very much. Um, some agencies do limit the use of abbreviations. For the purposes of this class, um, any abbreviations that are on the approved abbreviation list that I provide to you guys uh, through Google Classroom, <clears throat> you are permitted to use any of those abbreviations um, and certainly learn as many as you'd like. All right, so we're going to cover uh, 10 review questions here, and that'll wrap up uh, a quick chapter there, chapter five, medical terminology. Which of the following components of a medical term conveys its essential meaning? The prefix, the suffix, the word root, or combining vowel? The answer here for number one is C, the word root. The word root conveys the essential meaning of a medical term. Number two, prefixes can indicate color, conditions, body parts, or procedures? The answer for number two, prefixes can indicate a color. Prefixes are used to indicate colors, numbers, positions, or directions. Suffixes are indicating a procedure, condition, disease, or a part of speech. plural form of the word bronchus is what? The plural form of the word bronchus is which of the following? And the answer there for number three is D, bronchi. So the plural form of the word bronchus, if you remember, if the word ends in that S or US, it generally changes to an I. So that is bronchi D is the Number four, the statement, the lungs are superior to the bladder, indicates that the lungs are closer to the feet, surface of the skin, head, or the trunk. The answer for number four, the lungs are superior to the bladder, indicates that the lungs are closer to the head. So the answer there is C, head. Remember, superior means closer to the head. Inferior would be the opposite, meaning closer to the feet. Number five, movement of the arm towards the midline is referred to as flexion, extension, adduction, or abduction. Movement of the arm toward the midline is referred to as C, adduction. Remember, flexion is referring to the bending of a joint. Extension refers to straightening of a joint. Abduction is moving away from, away from the midline. And adduction is referring to moving toward the midline. Number six, a body part that lies closer to the midline when compared to another is considered medial, distal, lateral, or proximal. A body part that lies closer to the midline when compared to another is considered to be a medial. Medial means toward the midline. Distal is used to describe a body part that is further from the trunk. Lateral is describing a body part that lies away from the midline. 
proximal is used to describe a body part that is closer to the trunk. Number seven, this is used to identify a body part that is on the belly side or the anterior surface of the body, deep, superficial, dorsal, or ventral. The answer there for number seven, the belly side is the ventral side. D is the correct answer. Belly side is the ventral side. you place a patient in the semi fowler's position for transport this means that the patient is lying on his or her back lying on his or her stomach sitting at a 45 degree angle or sitting at a 90 degree angle the patient in the semi fowler's position is c sitting at a 45 degree angle they're sitting on their back but at a 45 degree angle i fowler's is that 90 degree angle sitting straight up Nine, a laceration located on the plantar surface is on the sole of the foot, palm of the hand, back of the body, or front of the body. Laceration located on the plantar surface is on the A, sole of the foot. Plantar surface is the sole of the foot. Palm of the hand would be the palmar surface. Number 10, when using abbreviations, acronyms, or symbols, an EMT should be familiar with those used in your agency, use only those that are uh, medically accepted, use them to shorten documentation, or D, all of the above. <clears throat> the answer here for number 10 is D, all of the above. All of these are correct. Abbreviations, acronyms, or symbols are used to, uh, excuse me, are used to shorten documentation. Um, you should only use those that are, that are medically accepted, and you should be familiar out with those used in your agencies. Again, some agencies restrict your use of um, abbreviations, acronyms, and symbols. So, again, um, the answer for number 10 is D, all of the above. All right, and that wraps up Chapter 5, Medical Terminology. Thanks for listening.